The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a massive unemployment crisis throughout the United States. Tens of millions of people have been pushed into the unemployment system as businesses shut down. That's prompted U.S. Senator Josh Hawley to put forward a big shift to how America deals with joblessness. He wants the federal government to entice companies to keep workers on the payroll in a manner that's similar to programs in some European countries. Holly talks with me about his plan on the latest episode of Politically Speaking and whether it can be a priority in the next round of coronavirus legislation. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that, that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision, and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. Well, we want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Rosenbaum, a political correspondent with St. Louis Public Radio. What you're about to hear is a conversation between Senator Josh Hawley and I about a plan he's backing to keep workers on a company payroll during the COVID-19 crisis. It's a different approach than the Paycheck Protection Program and the traditional unemployment system. In a nutshell, Hawley's plan would have the federal government cover the payroll costs of workers at companies adversely affected by coronavirus. It's an approach that Radha Christian Gopalan of Washington University says is mutually beneficial for employers and employees. And furthermore, we also avoid the hiring costs. So once firms lay off workers, then they have to hire new employees. They have to have an orientation. They have to onboard them. There's been a lot of chatter about how Holly's plan is similar to ones proposed by some Democratic lawmakers and whether it breaks with traditional GOP rhetoric when it comes to government programs. But honestly, I was more interested in talking with Holly about how the plan would actually be implemented and who it would help. That's especially the case since, as Camille Landé of the London School of Economics explained, European countries are using these programs now to prevent workers from being uprooted by the coronavirus pandemic. The economy is taking a a, a massive hit for sure. But what is kind of encouraging is that uh, the heat has been really mitigated quite a lot in European countries by the very high level of generosity of these short-term work programs that in general are, are more generous than unemployment insurance. I talked with Holly over the phone earlier this week, and I started off by asking him how a business would take advantage of this program if it was implemented. Well, the most important thing is, is that for workers, this is a plan that is designed to get workers back to work, to get them off of the sidelines, to get them back uh, to the workplace, even if they can't yet physically go to work, if, if they're Uh, regional areas shut down because of the health concerns over the virus, it will get them their job back, give their family that economic security and give them a get them at a position to contribute to the recovery and to bounce back. And, you know, the data has shown and study after study for years that the security that comes from having a job is the best thing for a family in terms of long term financial planning, in terms of being able to spend and make those decisions in terms of just your own personal uh, health, personal health, mental well-being, all of those things, employment so important. So this is a plan that is focused laser-like on employment and on getting people rehired. So the way it would work is this. This plan would cover the payrolls. It would cover 80% of the payroll costs uh, for every employee, every worker in America, which means it would flow to every business in America. The only thing the business would have to show is that they've actually been detrimentally affected by the coronavirus. So they'd have to show some revenue losses. Uh, We propose at least 10% revenue losses either month over month or year over year. So, you know, I'm I'm happy for businesses that are doing better or just as well during this time than those that aren't, but there's no reason that uh, we need to be supporting the payrolls, for instance, of like Amazon. Uh, They can do just fine on their own. So if the business can show real losses uh, from the coronavirus, then they would qualify 
for this program and it would use the existing payroll tax system. It's, it's basically a, a, an advanced payroll tax rebate, the one that would be uh, turned back from the federal government to the business for the employee. And again, covering 80% of payroll up to and including uh, the national median wage, which can be calculated in different ways, but you know, it works out to probably about $50,000. Uh, so that, that's the, those are the basic outlines and the, and the focus is jobs, jobs, jobs. I want to get to the how it's going to be paid for, because when they hear payroll, when people hear payroll tax rebate, they may think, well, this is money that would be going to Social Security or Medicare. I want you to address that because it doesn't seem like that's the case, but that could be a big sticking point uh, if it does end up affecting either of those programs. So it's a, it's a verbose way of saying, like, how does this end up getting paid for? It's paid from general revenues. It's, it does not come out of uh, Social Security or Medicare. We're not using, this is not a payroll tax holiday. Uh, it is It is not a payroll tax cut. It wouldn't affect the collection of the, of the actual payroll tax. It's the system that we're using. We're just, it's the quickest way. We've got to find a way to get support to workers quickly and efficiently and directly. Because one of the things we've learned with the PPP program, that's the SBA, the Small Business Administration program that's out there now with these loans, these loans are being administered through banks. And what we're seeing is that these banks, in my view, are, are really falling down on the job here. I mean, they, they are particularly the big banks, in fact, almost exclusively the big banks are prioritizing their richest customers. Uh, they are uh, slow walking loan applications from smaller business or from folks who didn't have credit lines with them before. That's the kind of thing we need to avoid. We need something that is going to get directly to the worker, that is going to benefit the worker worker directly, and also help the business stay afloat. One piece I didn't mention a second ago, Jason, that's important is I think we should also provide, along with the payroll support, a, a grant to help cover overhead expenses so the business doesn't shut down, doesn't go out of business. We need the business to be open so they can pay their employees. So I would propose something like 20% of historic revenues should be available uh, through this uh, system to the business to help them cover overhead costs, their rent, their mortgage, utilities, uh, things over and above payroll. Would there be any requirement for companies to also continue paying benefits like health insurance, 401k, things that also cost money to the employer besides just wages? Yeah, it would be whatever's covered under the employer's uh, payroll. So it would support, you know, healthcare typically is, is part of payroll. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things that's important that people get on the job is their healthcare coverage. And one of the, the detriments of, of being sent to the unemployment line, besides the fact that you lose your job security, is many times you also lose your healthcare. And of course, you know, Congress has passed uh, very significant unemployment assistance, which is out there and available. And, uh, and and we're spending significantly more on Medicaid, for instance, to try to help people who have who have lost their jobs and, and can't afford to purchase insurance. But that, that's all those are really second best options. I mean, that the, the best option is to help people either keep their job or get it back and to get uh, the health care protections that go with that. So uh, those this is one of the reasons that attachment to employment, actually being able to have a job and work is so important. And that's what we're trying to get back for folks. Would this be available to any company, even very large companies that may be going through economic shocks? And would this also be available to entities like nonprofit corporations and potentially state and local governments that have to lay people off? So it's a two part question, but I want you to address both of them. Yeah, the focus is on the is on workers. And so for that reason, what it really is, is trying to get individual workers uh, back to work, keep their jobs where they have it, get them their jobs back where they've lost them and keep them protected. So for that reason, the plan is, is, is completely agnostic as to the size of the business. All it, so it's available uh, regardless of the size of the business so long as there are losses. Again, you know, big businesses like Amazon who are doing quite well during this time, not available to them. You know, they, they don't need help in, in covering their employees. But what we've got, this is again, the quickest way routing it through businesses is the quickest way to get that support to workers and to maintain that job security, or if they've lost it, to get the worker uh, the job security back. You know, in terms of, of who would be available to state and local governments, others, I, I'd like, I think we should start with businesses. Uh, you know, the, the PPP, the uh, Paycheck Protection uh, Plan out there also covers a 501c3 nonprofits, I think 501c19 veterans organizations. So there's some precedent for that. That's probably where I would start. Um, 
uh, you know, that's going to cover most of the workers in the country, the vast, vast majority. Um, you know, we, I'm open to to uh, to other organizations, but I think let's focus on for profit businesses and the C3s and the C19s, uh, because that is where we found our the, the lion's share of, of businesses. And, you know, we could talk details in terms of if, if their case to be made. I wouldn't rule anything out, but let's let's focus on where the overwhelming number of Americans, the entities in which they work. One of the bullet points is that you would have a federal governmental portal as opposed to having somebody go through a bank, as you just mentioned. But one of the problems that I could foresee is this portal could get overloaded very quickly, and that could mean that the, the workers and the businesses are not getting this relief quick enough. How do you kind of avoid a situation that we're seeing a lot with PPP that this this new program would be overloaded and would ultimately not be effective in a COVID like crisis that we're seeing right now. Yeah, that's the whole you've hit on the whole reason why we suggest using the existing payroll tax system, because almost every business in the country has an existing relationship with the federal government through their payroll system, through the payroll tax system. So that's the whole purpose in using the existing payroll tax mechanism and the existing relationships ra rather than either trying to create new vehicles or routing it through banks or insurance companies or other third parties where it becomes much more indirect and, and then you have to end up exercising a lot of oversight over those entities. So, you know, how might that look like or what might that look like? Companies to be able to uh, use their existing payroll processors which many businesses use. If a business doesn't have a payroll service, they can have the option to temporarily partner with an approved payroll processing company, or they could just have, they, the business could just have payroll, uh, treasury rather, uh, pay them directly using their bank account information that would be on file with the IRS through their Schedule C's, their 1099s, or uh, IRS Forms uh, 7200. Now, the other thing that I could see being a sticking point, maybe between like Democrats that like this plan, is is the aforementioned 80 percent of national medium wage or income. Um, I certainly understand the reason for not making it unlimited, because that could mean that this could cost way too much money. But I could see the argument that it should be higher than 80 percent of the national median income because there are some states where making $50,000 is not as much money as, say, in Missouri, where that's quite a bit of money. That's the whole cost of living thing. And I'm sure I think that a, a Democrat out of Washington has had a higher cap probably for that reason. So how do you kind of find the sweet spot here and how do you come up with kind of a number that helps the most people, given the whole cost of living uh, variable to this entire debate? Well, I think we want to always prioritize workers who are working at the median and below the median because they are the most vulnerable. So I'm not adverse to, to covering workers. And I should emphasize that under my plan, you know, if you, if you have a if you're a salaried worker who makes one hundred thousand dollars a year, this this would cover a portion of your salary, but not one hundred thousand. You know, I mean, so the the the, uh, the the business is going to either have to choose to pick up that or you're going to have to take a temporary pay cut. So I think it is important as, as the details are would be negotiated in legislation is important to focus on workers who are most vulnerable and who historically have had the hardest time getting into the labor force and staying in the labor force. And those are people who work at or beneath the median wage. So those are folks we want to be sure are protected and covered and that the plan works for them because if it doesn't work for them, then we're really missing our target. You know, it's, it's, it's really not going to be worthwhile in the long run. So that's the thing I would say about that. In terms of why 80%, we think it's important to incentivize the business here. I mean, the business needs to have some skin in the game. Uh, we don't want businesses trying to jerry-rig the system uh, so that they uh, basically get a, a, a free ride. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the vast majority of businesses would do that, but we've already seen with the PPP that we do have some businesses out there who have been willing to... Uh, bend the qualifications in order to try and get uh, this money, uh, which has been, you know, unfortunate to see. We want to try and, and prevent that. It's another reason why we would require the business to actually show real losses um, from the coronavirus. But having said all of that, Jason, I think that, you know, we, we can have a negotiation as this is reduced to legislation and, and uh, adopted. We can have a negotiation about how many, how much should be covered, whether it should be 80 or 90 or 100 and up to what level. And I'm certainly open uh, to discussing that. I just want to emphasize that workers who are the most vulnerable ought to get the most protections. We'll be back right after this quick break with U.S. Senator Josh Hawley. 
If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And we're back with more of my conversation with U.S. Senator Josh Hawley. One economist that I talked to from the London School of Economics told me that there are kind of versions of this idea floating around in different states. And he thinks that a more practical course of action could be just incentivizing all the states to set up their own programs and then the federal government providing monetary and organizational assistance to this, similar to like Medicaid, for example. That's clearly not the direction that you want to go, at least with the framework. So I'd be interested to hear why that isn't the case, that you're going a state by state direction or it maybe would you be open to maybe taking that route since it may be more efficient for individual states to administer this type of program uh since you mentioned london you know this is uh, we've looked to, for some of the inspiration for this to what boris johnson's government his conservative government has done in the uk uh, and they have they have are covering now 80 percent of payroll up to their national median and so far have seen great success with this. So, you know, one of the reasons we have we have chosen the framework is we tried to in, uh, we talked with a number of economists. We looked at what other countries have done successfully, some not so successfully, tried to look at best practices. And, and the UK actually is, is an example of a best practice in terms of uh, having states set up. I, I, I don't like that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it would be terribly slow. I mean, and states are already incredibly overburdened, as they will tell you. Uh, I just talked to Governor Parson this morning, and they are working around the clock on everything from testing to the unemployment, you know, currently states unemployment systems, which were pre-existing, by the way, are totally overwhelmed. That's every single state. I mean, there's not a state in the country whose unemployment system is not overwhelmed. And I think we've found in this crisis uh, that the, you know, what what this uh, economist you reference is suggesting sounds a little bit like our existing unemployment system where the federal government funds it or fund some of it, but the states administer it. And that has really proven to be very slow. It is an enormous administrative burden. It's very uneven in its administration. And and it's it's just something that I think, frankly, we don't have the time to build out. Speed is of the essence here. And also, I'm not interested in creating new federal programs that last for perpetuity. This is an emergency. It's an emergency created by an unprecedented health pandemic and created by the government's response to try and stop that pandemic. I mean, Let's remember the reason that so many people have lost their jobs is because the government has chosen to shut down our economy and to shut down economic life in order to address this health crisis. So this is a a truly unprecedented situation caused in part by government action directed at at alleviating the health burden. But I think for that reason, direct, swift government response to get people their jobs back is going to be what's necessary to get us to recover. And, and uh, for that reason, I think creating new programs that last forever, that's not what we should be trying to do here. We're not trying to remodel our economy. We're trying to get people back to work and uh, get ourselves in a position to recover. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned speed, because one of the issues that I see with getting this plan up and running is that some of the other countries that have programs like this and are using them during the COVID economic crisis, these programs have been in existence for decades. And Frankly, I'm a little skeptical that you would be able to get this up and running really quickly if, say, a sur- there's a surge of COVID cases in the fall. So how do you implement this so this is not just a complete administrative nightmare when it goes online? Well, I think that's, again, why you try to use an existing system. I mean, this is why we gravitated towards uh, the payroll tax system. And uh, after we proposed this, as, as you've referenced, a, a number of others have come out and have proposed uh, similar plans, and they also you all use the payroll tax system because everybody who's looked at this has has come to the co- same conclusion that in our country, with our setup between businesses and and uh, the government, uh, the the best system we have available is that payroll system. And so I think again, you, you try not to reinvent the wheel. You try to use what we have now, uh, and uh, you try to use it in a way that will be fast and will be efficient. I, I'm not saying that there wouldn't be problems, hiccups. Dip, of course there would be, but uh, nobody has been able to identify a system that would be faster um, that's already in existence. And I just don't think we have time to build one. And again, build, building a system, it takes time, it takes additional money, uh, and, and we just don't, we don't have that. So I think the pay, using the payroll tax system makes a lot of sense. Um, it's already in place. It, it can be uh, something that we think we can repurpose 
temporarily for this endeavor. And, um, you know, I'm listen, having said that, I'm open to other ideas. If somebody out there has a better idea of a delivery mechanism, I'm all ears. But I can tell you, for the economists that we have talked to and the Treasury uh, the folks that we have talked to, uh, everybody has said this. We really think this is the best option in terms of a delivery vehicle. Congress is going to likely talk about phase four soon. It's clear that some Democrats really like this idea, because as we've alluded to during the conversation, there have been some senators and and representatives who have kind of put forward different versions of this idea. But I, I read the Washington Post article that you were just quoted in uh, talking about this plan, and it seems like the struggle in Washington is about whether to send aid to state and local governments or if the Republicans that run the Senate even want to go forth with some of these new types of programs that may cost some money. So what does it mean for this type of plan? Does it get lost in the shuffle? Or are you going to try to use your power as a senator to make sure that this is in the forefront of discussion when Congress returns and starts talking about phase four? I think the strongest argument for this plan are the facts. And that is we have 27 million Americans who have lost their jobs in the last month. We have an unemployment rate that is in the upper double digits now, estimates between 16 and 20%. It's the highest since the 1930s. Those are the facts. And we're going to have to do something about it. I mean, we're not going to have an economy to open up if nobody has jobs. And my own view is, as we shift towards recovery, as we, as we move towards economic recovery, our focus needs to be on jobs. So, uh, I think that you know people will make their own decisions, other members, about uh, about the merits and demerits of this proposal. But I think that the economic facts and the facts about jobs are going to be hard facts to ignore. And unfortunately, it's not going away. I mean, I, I hope that we will see those unemployment numbers come down. But my guess is we're not going to see them come down meaningfully anytime soon, absent some action. Uh, to get this economy jump started, and you know, I don't even like talking in those abstractions, Jason, because the economy is really made up of workers. I mean, it, it's the people who go to work every day, who are responsible for this nation's health, who are responsible for the food that we eat, for the clothes that we wear, for the goods that we uh, pick up from those delivery drivers who leave them at our door. I mean, the workers make those things. That's why this plan is focused on workers, and that's why when we talk about economic relief, we need to have. Uh, to my way of thinking, let's talk about bankers and about banks this and banks that, and more talk about workers. And I think that the, this plan's inspiration and its single greatest recommendation is the needs of working families in this country. Do you think that this plan would ease some of the angst we're seeing about stay-at-home orders since it may reduce the economic anxiety among both employers and employees? I know that that may not be like the main reason you're doing this, but it seems like that would be a consequence of this, that let's say we have to put in rigid stay-at-home orders in the fall because there's a surge. If this program is in place, people may be willing to to handle them longer. What do you think about that consequence if this if this proposal is actually put in place? Yeah, I think it I think it is makes a huge difference to workers and families to know that they have a job. And you know, listen, I, people who I talk to, I'm talking to you from Springfield today, and uh, you know, I, I, as I talk to folks around town, as I go around town. Everybody wants to work. I mean, no, nobody is enjoying this, obviously. I mean, and people are getting stir crazy. They want to go back to work, but they're also willing to do their part to break the back of this health epidemic. So I think to your question, have people being able to say, you know what, even if I am told I cannot physically go to work, I may not like that. But if I know I'm going to have my job, then, you know, that makes a little difference. And I'm still not going to like it. It's still going to be tough. But it makes a big difference to know I've got my job, I can provide for my family, I'll be in a position to contribute to this recovery as we get off the ground. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that's vital. People want to work. I think getting in a position to work is critical. And again, you know, 27 million unemployment claims nationally, about 400,000 here in the state of Missouri. That's 400,000 too many. We, we need to get folks those jobs back so that they'll be ready to hit the ground running when we can open up. That's it for this edition of Politically Speaking. You can find all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. I'm Jason Rosenbaum, and until next time, so long.